going to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to study. Study in your word, Lord, about salvation, learn about suffering, trusting in you, finding victory. We pray right now that as we search through your word, that you would guide us, that you would give insight. Uh, Lord, you promised in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, Lord, I pray that you would give me love and a sound mind, that my mind would share what you would have me to share, that you would bring it together into the message you'd have for the hour. We pray for your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. I remember uh, speaking with a lady some time ago, and she had shared with me, she, she had been a smoker, I'd been a smoker, I know what it's like, it's, very, it's a difficult temptation, especially as you're struggling with the withdrawal symptoms and so forth, but nevertheless, one of the things, she had been a smoker in the past, and she had prayed to God at one time, and God gave her victory, she just quit smoking, didn't even desire it, it was actually easy to overcome, God had given her the victory, but then something must have happened in her life, a stress or whatever, she went back to smoking, and she, she didn't want again she said you know I'm not going to quit until God takes it away from me I'm not going to take I'm not going to quit smoking until God just takes the temptation away because sometimes people fear they think well maybe you know if I would if I'd fight to overcome that that means I'm a legalist if it's not easy to do something then you're a legalist if you try to accomplish that now, we only think that way in the re religious realm, right? No, no young man, if he's really, really interested in a young lady and says, ah, if it doesn't come easy, you know, I just won't pursue her, right? Some, some will be that way, but many young men, they're going to fight like crazy to get the young lady. The reality is we will fight for things in this world, but when it comes to spiritual things, we think no effort should be put forth or that would be legalism. If you have to suffer to overcome, is that legalism? Well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? To be an overcomer, we're talking about salvation. And in the aspect of salvation, we've talked about righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if you put effort into something, does, is that a work and therefore not of faith? That's the question. If you have to suffer to overcome, does that mean that you are working by works of the law and not by faith? What does the Bible say? The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, speaking of our Savior, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. The Bible tells us for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Was Jesus righteous by his works? Meaning, was he, he a bad example for us? We shouldn't look to him as our Savior. No, he was the true Savior. He found victory. And the Bible says Jesus suffered in the flesh to overcome sin. And the text doesn't just stop there. It says you need to arm yourselves with the same mind. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Look at it for yourself. What does it say? It says that if you suffer in the flesh who cease from sin, Jesus did that, and we need to have the same mindset as Jesus himself. What an interesting thought, that Jesus, when he was tempted, it made him suffer. It was, he suffered through being tempted so that he could be our Savior, so that he could be the one who gains the victory. And we are called to be overcomers. We talked about the fact that in Revelation, it says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we see over and over again, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. God says he's going to have a group of over overcomers, people that keep the commandments of God by faith. You can't keep them by your own steam, by your own strength. It is by trusting with with all your heart in the Savior. But the reality is, in order to overcome temptation, we sometimes have to suffer being tempted. What does that mean? 
What does that mean? Well, uh, in this particular situation, this woman is struggling and, and she wants to quit. She desires to quit because it's hurting her lungs, it's hurting her body and overall, and it's slowly killing her. You know, it's a progressive suicide. But she wanted to overcome, but she said, no, 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 not until God gives me the victory, until he just takes it all away from me. But the text says that Jesus suffered to overcome temptation. And in the same way, we need to suffer. It says, arm yourselves with the same mindset so that just as Jesus would suffer through difficulties and temptation, we too need to go through the same situation. So when maybe you want to smoke desperately or you want to yell at someone or you want to go through these things, initially when we first come into these situations and we want to overcome, we need to suffer. Now God doesn't want to just leave you there. He wants to give you the victory. He wants to change your heart from the very core. Uh, He wants to change you in the very heart so that the springs are changed. But we also know there is flesh. There is flesh is a part of this life. We've talked about the fact that in Romans chapter 8, uh, you see it in 5 and 6, it says, it says, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What, what this means is that those who keep their mind on fleshly things, if you have, because by nature we have done that, when we want to actually begin to follow after spiritual things, the trouble is we've been in the flesh. So when we begin to turn from the flesh to the spiritual, there is a struggle. The flesh fights against it by nature. But we can choose to cling to Jesus and we can choose to suffer being tempted. We can go through that just as our Savior did. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 2. It gives almost the same wording, but it gives us a little more insight on this, on this subject of suffering. Look in Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to look in verse 18. It says, for as much, it says, for in that he himself, Jesus, for as much as he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted or succor them that are tempted. Meaning, for as much as Christ himself has suffered being tempted. Again, it says he suffered during temptation. It says he is able to help you who also are tempted. So because Jesus went through the sufferings of temptation here on earth in the same way he is able to help you to go through temptation. So we need to learn from our Savior Jesus. He knew what it was like to suffer under temptation. Now, do we see times when Jesus would suffer being tempted? Notice what it says. You're, this is Hebrews chapter 2. Hang on right into chapter 5. And in chapter 5, verse 8, we read these words. Though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. Suffering is a part of the Christian experience. Suffering is a part of this life we live. Change causes suffering. Overcoming temptation causes suffering. When the, when the devil comes in, when our flesh rises up, it is suffering to actually fight against temptation. It is easier to just succumb to temptation many times. But the guilt, the pain, the, the disconnection with God after we have sinned is is. It causes another kind of pain, another kind of suffering. So we suffer either way. If we fall into sin, we suffer. If we are going to be faithful, there's a suffering that takes place. And many times we just want to give up. We just want to give up. But Jesus himself is our example. Even though he were a son, it says, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus suffered for our sake. Now, where do we see times of Jesus actually suffering to overcome temptation? Now, the greatest example would be in Matthew chapter 4. Not the greatest. I guess the cross would be the number one. This would be probably the second one, other than Gethsemane and the cross. Matthew chapter 4. Notice what happens in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, let me ask you a question. If you fasted 40 days and 40 nights, do you think that would fit under the realm of suffering? That would be suffering, right? There's no question. Jesus was suffering. And notice, he was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
So Jesus in this situation, in his time of suffering, that when we are tempted, when, we, when our heart is rising up to live in sin, we are in a situation where we have to suffer if we're going to overcome. Jesus, for as much as he himself had suffered and being tempted, he is able to help us who are tempted. For as much as then has Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Jesus, when he went into the wilderness and was, was fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was struggling. He was suffering hunger. And I've shared this before, but in scientists have actually studied and they've looked at what happens to any individual. They were studying specifically willpower. And when they're studying willpower, one of the things they noticed is that when your blood sugar drops, when you become hypoglycemic, that you are more likely, scientists have discovered that you're more likely to fall under temptation and to, to become weak on your willpower when your blood sugar is low. Jesus, it's clear at this time, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, his blood sugar was extremely low, so it was all the easier to, to fall under the temptation that he was suffering. But Jesus, in this situation, the devil comes to him, he's extremely weak. I mean, he's literally dying of hunger at this point. And as he is, the tempter came to him, comes to him and he says, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now, if he came to me and asked me to do that, it wouldn't be a temptation because I don't have the power to turn stone to bread. The thing is, Jesus did. But Jesus, as a human being, as he became a human being for us, yes, he was God from all eternity, but he, be, but he became a human being for us. And in that, he had to, just like the Bible says in John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing. Well, he could do of him own self uh, anything, but he chose not to as a human, so he had experienced life just like we do. I can do nothing of myself. And so he, he could have, by his divine strength, just made those stones become bread, but then he would have been succumbing to the temptation of the enemy. So instead, he had to live just like a human being and trust in God rather than trusting in his you know, divinity. And so Jesus says... It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So notice, Jesus puts, he says, listen, I'm going to trust in God and his word, and I'm going to live by what he says, rather than by my flesh, rather than what my body is craving for. I'm rather going to put God's word first than do this, rather than turn away from God's word. Now, the Bible says in Job chapter 23, verse 11 and 12, my foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined, neither have I gone back on the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, I, I have kept the commandments of God, is what he basically said, and I have esteemed God's word more than food itself. I would rather be faithful to the word of God and not be able to eat than to turn away from God for, my, for the lusts of the flesh. I would rather be faithful to the word of God. So Job understood that if we're going to be ultimately faithful to our Savior... If we're ultimately going to walk with the Savior Jesus Christ, we need to put the Word of God even before the things that we eat. If we're going to ultimately follow God, and, and appetite, I never would have believed, actually, when I first heard that appetite was a great, you know, one of the greatest things for humanity to overcome, I, I didn't believe it. I thought, ah, that's not that big of a deal. But I realize now, seeing it in humanity, even in my own life, that, that putting, to put the Word of God before food is a serious, serious temptation. Jesus put the word of God first. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Job said, I have esteemed the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. And Jesus, in essence, said the same thing when he was suffering nigh unto death. He was suffering near unto death for, for being faithful to God. He was suffering being tempted. And it says, in the same mind, we are to arm ourselves with that mind. A willingness to suffer under temptation. Many times what happens when the temptation comes, a little bit of suffering comes, and we're like, ah, skip it, I'm not going to do it. But no, God is saying, you need to suffer. Under that temptation, suffer just as your Savior did. He suffered to overcome temptation, and He can now help you because He's been through it. He's been through the temptations. He's been through the trials. He knows what it's like, and He can strengthen you in times of trials and tribulations. 
What is an example of that? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16 tells us. It's a seeing then that we have a great high priest that has entered into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he knows what it's like to suffer under temptation, yet he did it and never, never was overcome by the temptation. He was without sin. It goes on to say in verse 16, Let us come therefore boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain grace and mercy to help in the time of need. So we need this grace and mercy from Jesus. He, we can come to him and say, Jesus, I know you've been through this. I know you've been through this trial. And Jesus, I pray that you will help me, that you will give me the victory. But it will take suffering. Now, I want you to notice this. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Old Testament book, when Jesus was quoting, when he was quoting this, man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus wasn't just making something up. He was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, notice what it says. It says, And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee, and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. So notice it says, God tested you, and he humbled you to see whether you would keep his commandments or not. And it says, and in, ver, in the next verse, verse 3, it says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know, that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So the text says that God has tested his people. He says, I want you to remember all the ways that I've led you in your past. And it would do well for us to do the same things that look back on the, our own spiritual life and remember times that God has led us in the past. And when we remember the times that God has led us in the past, it gives us encouragement. It gives us strength and stamina to press forward, realizing that he's taken care of me in the past. And if he's taken care of me in the past, he will surely take care of me in the future. But the text says, And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Now keep in mind, Keep in mind the context. Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 4 is quoting, and he quotes, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So think about this. Jesus quotes this. Where is Jesus when he quotes this? He's in the wilderness. He's being suffered to hunger, and he's suffering with temptation to see whether he would put God's word first, keep his commandments first, or put the lust of the flesh, like eating first. And now keep this in mind. Keep Jesus in your mind as we read the text again. As Jesus is suffering being hungered 40 days, remember a day for a year in Bible prophecy, this is just kind of symbolic in this passage, but Jesus is suffering being tempted for 40 days, and while he's suffering for 40 days, hungry, whether he would keep God's commandments or no, the devil is there to tempt him, and his response is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus quotes this, and it fits the context of the Old Testament. Read it again. And thou Thou shalt, this is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, and thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. Jesus was suffering for 40 days. They were suffering for 40 years. And thou shalt remember all the, all the things, ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness, Jesus is in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. So Jesus is in the wilderness and so that we can see, would he keep God's commandments or no? Verse 3 says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So what does it say? Jesus was suffered being tempted. The Israelites were suffering being tempted and they failed because the suffering to them was too great. They would turn away from God in the times of their hunger. They would turn away from God in the times of their thirst because they were saying, if God loves me, why would we have to do this? I mean, in essence that they were saying. 
Why did you lead us out here to kill us in the wilderness? It would have been better to be back and we could have had the, the leeks of Egypt. We could have had the wonderful, you know, onion flavored, you know, food of Egypt rather than dying here in the wilderness with no water and no food. So what they were doing is as their heart was being tested, they were struggling too much that they let go of their, their reliance upon God in their suffering. They took their mind off of God. But Jesus suffered as an example for us, a living example, and he says, I can be with you. I can strengthen you in your time of suffering. So what do we see here? We see simply that Jesus overcame his 40 days in the wilderness. He was suffered to being tempted. And as he was there, what did he do? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. I'm not going to put food first. I'm going to put the word of God first. Job said the same thing. Job said, I have esteemed the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. You know, there is a prophetic aspect to this. That this is an example of what God's people, in, in the beginning Adam and Eve struggled, their issue had, their temptation had to do with food. Their issue had to do with food. Job, one of his things that he at least said, we don't see that he was so much struggling with food, but he said, I've esteemed the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. We come down to the days of Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am going to put God and his word and his will before food, right? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And in the very last days, the trial for God's people. Now we know there's a test we know God has given us his law, specifically his fourth commandment, as a test in the last days. And if you are faithful to his commandments, you're going to be suffered to hunger. Really? Is that what the Bible says? Look with me in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Will we be faithful? Will we cling to the one who has already been faithful, Jesus, and cling to him that he gives us the strength to live the faith of Jesus? Revelation chapter 13. Notice what it says. It says in Revelation chapter 13, verses 13, speaking of the second beast of Revelation, this second beast, the first beast, uh, obviously has power and authority, and the second beast is promoting that authority, working miracles in the sight of the beast, deceiving the world with these miracles. And it says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 13, it says... In verse 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven and on earth in the sight of men. Notice what it says, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause or force, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Notice the key points here in verse 18. And he causes, bo causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their foreheads, in their right hand or in their foreheads. And here's the key. And no, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So notice what the key is. At the end of time, those who are faithful to keeping, because it says in chapter 14, those who are faithful to keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they are, going to, they are not going to be able to buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. So you can imagine the temptation. You, if, you, if you will just go Go along with society, go along with the popular teachings of the churches. If you go along with society in general, you're going to be saved. You're going to be okay. You'll be fine. But if you don't do this, if you're going to stick to following the word of God, if you're going to say, oh, no, I'm going to be faithful to the word of God, well, then we're not going to allow you to buy or sell. Then you're not going to be able to buy or sell. So think about this. You're in a situation where you are tested. Remember the verse. We're being tested to see what will we put. Will we put the food first or we, will, will we put the word of God? This is the test for the end of time. Will we put the food that we have to eat to survive or will we put God first? Right? Because that's what it says. And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. So will you keep his commandments when you're suffering to hunger? He says, and he suffered you to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So the test was for the Israelites in the wilderness, would they put God's word first or would they put food first? That was the temptation they had to struggle with there in the wilderness. And that temptation came to Jesus. Jesus was in the wilderness. Would he put food first or would he put the word of God first? And in the very last days... God's people will be put through this temptation. Will they put God's word first, his commandments first, or would they put, you know, well, imagine how you could rationalize. Imagine how a man could rationalize. The New Testament says, and this is a good thought for every man out there, there are many men today, I know in society, I've seen them, I've been to the houses, where there are many men today who their wife goes to work every day, wins the bread, and the man stays home and plays video games. The Bible says that a man who does not take care of the needs of his household is worse than an infidel. If a man will not work, the Bible says if a man does not work, neither should he eat. And if a man is not willing to work and he just wants to play video games all day and, you know, his work, wife does the work, you know, uh, maybe he ought not eat, right, until he can get up and do a little bit of work, right? But beside the point, you can imagine a man could make an excuse and say, well, we're at the time of, you know, we're coming up on these last days and we see that uh, if I receive the mark of the beast, then I can make money, then I can pay for food, and then I can take care of my family. God wants me to take care of my family. And so if God, I, I'd be worse than an infidel if I didn't take my care of my family. So I can at least break God's commandments so I can help feed my family. You see how we can rationalize? We can rationalize why we can break God's fourth commandment. We can rationalize, oh, it's okay to break God's commandments. It's okay to do that. But Jesus, when he was suffering being tempted, he says, I will follow God's word rather than the food that I need to eat for my body. The Israelites were supposed to say the same thing that Job said, that I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And our test in the last days will be, will we put God's word, our relationship with Jesus, will we be faithful to the commandments of God? God, or will we put our bodily needs first? The reality is we will be suffered to hunger. And the reality is, if we're not learning to suffer being tempted today, not just in hunger, but in, in other issues, if we don't learn to overcome the sufferings of temptation today, we all go through suffering. There's no question whether you're a Christian, an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, it doesn't matter. All human beings have suffering at some point in life. We all have some kind of suffering, but the question is, how will we respond to the suffering? Will we cling ever closer to the Savior, Jesus Christ, or will we allow these things to take us away from Jesus? Jesus suffered through these temptations as we have to. Jesus suffered being hungered. Jesus suffered being t tempted. And the text tells us in, in 1 Peter chapter 4 that we're to arm ourselves with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So if we can learn to suffer under trials, suffer under temptations, we can find victory over temptations. It is not righteousness by works to suffer under temptation. When, if we are suffering under temptation, we're clinging to Jesus by faith. And we're saying, Jesus, I can't overcome on my own. Jesus, I don't have the strength, but I want to put your word first. I want to put your will first, not food, not difficulties, not anything. I don't want to put anything before you, God. I want your word to be first in my life. Suffering is not easy. God did not say that it was easy. The word temptation that is generally used, at least in the New Testament, comes from a Greek word that, that is, when you look it up, one of the definitions of this word temptation are to be assayed. Assayed. A-S-S-A-Y-E-D. Assayed. Now, what does it mean to be assayed? Well, uh, an assayer, basically, you, you take a, a kind of metal and you try to purify that metal and you can assay it. You're testing it to be, see of what manner of sort it is. It is being tested, and obviously it goes through the fire to come to that point. They have to burn it and to get off all the dross, to get all the, the, the impure metals away from the purest metal, from the gold or from the silver. You know, So you're trying to separate these things so you have the pure metal. 
And we go through temptations, we go through trials, we go through sufferings, and it is, we are being assayed. The fire is burning around us, and it is, God is trying to remove the dross. Not that every, not that God is tempting us, he's not the one who's tempting us, but through the temptations we're being tested. God is right there with us, and if we will suffer being tempted, clinging to our Savior Jesus, not letting go of him in the time of trial. When we're trying to make a decision, will I, will I break God's fourth commandment for food if we say you know what God your word comes first man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live God I'm going to trust you and your strength regardless if if I die regardless if I starve I will be faithful but did you know that the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 16 and this text I believe even in the context fits within a, a last day experience in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 16 it says, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Now think about this. God promises his last day people, though yes, there will be a mark of the beast crisis. Though yes, they are going to tell you that you're going to die if you don't give your life to the state. If you don't follow the traditions of man, you're not going to be able to buy or sell and you're going to die. You're going to starve. God says that he, this, the bread and water will be sure. But notice the context. At the beginning of verse 16, Isaiah 33, verse 16, he says, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Where does this individual seem to be at this time? He is in the wilderness. He seems to be in the mountains. As God's people are called to flee forth at this time period, they seem to be in the mountains. His place of defense is the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. God has promised that he will be with his people. He will be with his people under the time of temptation during this mark of the beast crisis. He will strengthen them. They will be overcomers. There will be a group of people. There will be a group of people. Many don't believe it, but it, the Bible says it. And you say, well, that's too incredible. Listen, if God says it, that's the truth, regardless of what man thinks. He says there will be a group of people who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There will be a group of people who care more about the word of God than even saving their own skin. They would rather die than turn against the word of God. And he's calling us. He's calling us to be faithful, to be overcomers, to be willing to suffer. Because friends, I truly believe that all the sufferings that come during this lifetime, and there is suffering, it is genuine, it is painful. But all the sufferings in this life when we get to see, when we're on the, when finally Jesus takes us to the kingdom above after the millennium, we have this new heaven and new earth. I can tell you that if we are faithful unto death, not only will he give us a crown of life, but we will say all of it was but nothing in comparison with the joy of dwelling in, in eternity with our Savior Jesus Christ. That there is, there, I mean, it's not even, I mean, these, these sorrows, they are real, they are painful, they are difficult. Jesus, yes, he suffered being tempted. Yes, he went through great trials there in, in the wilderness there. Jesus, through life as people tormented him, yes, he went through sufferings. Jesus, as he was making his way to Gethsemane, and he began to sweat great, you know, drops of blood, you know, began to burst through his capillaries from this intense struggle and trial and temptation. Regardless, through all this, in the end, it says that he looked, he, there was a joy that was set before him, that he knew that someday, someday people's lives would be saved through his sacrifice. And in the same way, if you were willing to sacrifice today, if you were willing to sacrifice, you know, looking different, looking strange for Jesus Christ's sake, you will see by God's grace, others who will be in the kingdom because of your results, because of your work. And it's all through Jesus. Jesus is the one who is working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He was giving the victory, but your suffering can be a blessing, a blessing to somebody else. And the reality is we can all say in the end, those sufferings were but little compared to the joy of eternity with our Savior, Jesus Christ. The text says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Maybe there's someone who's thinking, you know, I've been suffering a lot lately. I just feel like giving up. 
I just want to give it up, and, and I don't even know, is it even worth being faithful to God? Jesus' example shows us it is well worth it, my friend. Jesus suffered during his lifetime. He suffered in the flesh because he knew there was a joy that was set before him. And in the same way, you may be struggling now. But Jesus is saying, cling to me. Learn obedience through the things which you suffer. That's what it says. Though he were a son, Hebrews 5 verse 8. Though Jesus were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus wants to give us the victory. He suffered being tempted. It says he is able to help those as a result, those who are tempted. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, God is saying, will you go through the trial? Will you cling to me? Will you cling to my word? Not letting go of me in the trial. Jesus didn't let go of the Father while he was on the cross. Though he, was, though he sensed he was forsaken of God, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But yet he never let go. You may feel that you are forsaken of God today. You may feel that God, your, your prayers, you know, hit the roof and, and God doesn't hear you. That's not the case. God hears your prayers. You can know by faith, even if the world seems dark around you, in your trial, in your temptation, cling to Christ. Cling to the Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to learn day by day, the days that we're living in the green tree today, we need to be clinging to Christ so that when we enter into the true tribulation toward the end, we will cling and we will not let go. Jesus is saying, do not let go. And he promises that even in the great tribulation at the end of time, when the issue is buying or selling, when you will not be able to buy or sell, you won't be able to buy food and these kind of things, we are told, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. But God is asking us, will you be suffered to hunger? And I will, you will be tested to know whether you will keep my commandments or no. And God is saying, will you be faithful and say with Jesus, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Is that your desire? To say, Jesus, I need your strength. I suffer temp being tempted today. I know I'm going to suffer. When, you know, you may be thinking, man, when my husband comes home and he speaks negatively, negatively to me, I'm going to suffer being tempted. It's true. But listen, cling to Jesus even in the midst of that. Rather than responding with anger, show, show kindness and love. Jesus, when people treated him bad, unjustly treated him bad, Jesus, as they, they suffered him to go through these temptations, he showed love and response. And I want to challenge you that any of your temptations that you may go to, cling to the Savior. Learn to cling to Him. Learn to keep your eyes open and notice when you're entering into the temptations, you're entering into the suffering, and to cling to the Savior all the more. He's calling us to be faithful today, and he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. The same shall be saved. Jesus is calling us. And once again, someone may be saying, but Chad, I don't have the strength. And you know what? You're right. I don't either. Jesus, as a human being, said, I can of my own self do nothing. He's basically saying, I don't have the strength. He was trusting in his heavenly Father to bring him all the way through. And in the same way, we can trust in Jesus through the strength of the Holy Spirit that he can bring us through. He that has begun, or Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident, being confident of this very thing. If, you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ into your life and you cling to him by faith, you can claim the promise of Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in us shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can be confident of that if we will cling by faith to the Savior Jesus Christ. Is that your desire to say, I want to cling to Jesus. I want to cling to the Savior, not letting go, not letting the things of this world, the temptations of the world, not letting my desire for the things of this world get in the way, but I want to cling to Christ during all the trials and temptations and tribulations. Is that your desire? Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you didn't tell us that things would always be easy. We do know at the same time, we may be going through tribulation right now and we feel like it will never go away. We may be going through a trial in life right now, but we are told in James chapter four, we are told there in seven and eight that submit yourselves therefore to God, 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse ye hand, your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The text says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Father, we recognize that we may be going through a trial right now, but generally these trials, they come and they go. We know there's an ultimate trial in the end, but even that trial comes and goes. Even though when we're in the midst of it, we feel, it feels like it is an eternal trial, but we recognize that the sufferings of this world are but temporary. Even the passing pleasures of sin are only temporary. And may we cling to you, learning to cling to you, learning that it, even if we have to suffer being tempted to overcome temptation, it is all worth it because Jesus, for as much then as he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help those who are tempted. Jesus is here to help because he went through it already. May we cling to our Savior, Father. May we have an experience of victory from your strength, Father, may we realize that our salvation is not of our own, but it is in Jesus Christ. If we cling and live by faith in him, we have eternal life. If we are faithful to him, in the name of Jesus, amen.